cases uh, from the Renaissance, quite a few of them that exist in France, very beautiful cases. Uh, but when you go and play those organs, everything that's inside, and usually the facade pipes as well, is, is newer, not really going all the way back to the 16th century. Uh, but the cases themselves, themselves sometimes exist. But what was going on in the 16th century, uh, people don't know very much about it. So I've been working on this topic, a very large research project, for many years, and I'll be publishing, uh, well, I'll be completing, I hope, within the next couple of years. Uh, I'm basing my work on uh, mostly on uh, legal documents that exist in archives in France, uh, contracts between builders and churches, work orders, account book entries that may tell us about the, some repair works that are going on on organs, uh, all that sort of thing. And uh, I have about 160 documents that I've transcribed and I've done uh, work on terminology because the terminology is difficult uh, and um, translation. And, and so it's a very big project. It will come out in, a, in at least two or possibly three volumes eventually. Year. But I'm going to just, which is the tip of the iceberg today, give you a little bit of an idea of what was going on in France during the 16th century leading ultimately to the organs of uh, Jean Titus, who was, we call him the father of French organ music. I think it's a very appropriate title because, not just for composition, but also because of the organs. Uh, he was the most important consultant at the time, and a very new, for the time, new style of organ building came in under his direction. And a type of organ by the early 17th century that you would recognize as being French, similar stops to what you would get much later with Papi and Cole and the present day, you would understand that this sounds, this is looks like French, French organ. But if you go back uh, 50 years earlier, maybe 1550 or so, uh, the organs, would, you would not think were French. So um, I, what I'm interested in is showing something of the development and, sh and giving you an idea at, at the end of what the tea blues organ was like. It's a kind of pre-classical, almost like the classical style organs of Cooper and Degree and so on. It's not developed that far, but well along the way toward that. They're close already by the time that T. Toulouse was publishing. I think most of you have might recite this, but played some T. Toulouse. Um, I start with, uh, now I'd like to start with an organ. Um, now you have to realize none of these exist. Well, almost none. You, you, there will be a couple that I'll talk about to do, but almost none of them, although the case is not. I'll start with an organ from Amiens, uh, cathedral. Amiens, at the time, the dark that was in this uh, 16th century, that was the border of France, the dark, and the lighter is the current border. And France just kept getting bigger and bigger, the kingdom. Amiens was a border town at the time. Uh, it's the largest cathedral, complete cathedral in France. You get an idea of looking at the people down there, how immense this cathedral is. <laughs> The organ, I want to start with the organ in Amiens Cathedral, uh, which we have an inventory of the pipework of the organ from 1549, so one period when I'm working, uh, of what was what existed, but that was a very old organ. It had been built in 1422 and probably not changed. In 1549, they did an inventory, and I've done a new transcription of this. And the inventory indicates, it tells you how many pipes were sounded or were existed for each note of the keyboard. Uh, and there are ex exactly 2,500 pipes in that organ that was built in 1422. I don't know if that uh, surprises anybody, but organs, very old organs, sometimes had an enormous number of pipes. But this organ had no stops. It was what we call a blockwerk. It's a very important term for us. This is a Gothic giant, uh, which had no stops. Probably there was a way to shut off the pipes inside the case so you could just hear the facade pipes. So you would only have two possible sounds, the facade pipe, pipes, or the whole thing. It was really one enormous principal chorus. We have no Gothic giants in existence today, but I believe that many people in this room, maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, but 
But I believe in your lifetime, someone, somewhere, will build one of these for us. Maybe we need two or three, because the first time they might not get it right. But it has to be in a big acoustic something with an enormous number of pipes. 32 foot principle, you know, enormous. Is, but just a mixture organ in the old Pythagorean tuning, it will completely revolutionize the way we hear organ for the future. You won't be able to play much organ music on it. You'll have to learn to improvise on it. But uh, because we don't have very much. But it would be very interesting. The organ itself, we know about. We can see the case still exists. This is newer. The positif was added later. But the case still exists, probably much like it did in 1422. And they're very old cases sometimes in France. On this side here, this is very interesting. There was a grave marker made with a sketch of the organ from 1422 with the donors holding it on the side. They were buried underneath the organ. It'd be nice to have donors today who are that excited about the organ that they want to be buried underneath it. They were buried underneath. At the time of the revolution, that grave marker was melted down. It was conquered, but a sketch was made. So we have the sketch. Now the organ, it looks a bit different. The number of pipes is obviously different. This is a, probably a rough sketch from the original grave marker that may not have been totally accurate. But you see three towers separated by two flats. The middle one is the tallest, three towers, two flats, the middle ones. It's the same organ. I'm sure it's the same organ. This had 21 pipes per key on the bottom, lowest note, and 95 per key at the top, with the progression, gradual progression. And I now know what, how many were on the, the chests of the organ because of this inventory that I've transcribed. How, what was, so this will help us in the future if somebody wants to actually re reproduce a Gothic giant. It's a very important text for us uh, to understand this. This is important because the old organ in France uh, of the 15th century and earth, these were block bear organs. They had no stops. Something radical changed uh, right around the turn of the century, about 1500, when stops came in to France. In 1594, the King of France, 1494, the King of France, Charles VIII, decided that he wanted to invade Italy. He had a claim. You may have read about this in your history classes. He had a claim to Naples, the kingdom of Naples in the south of France. And he gathered a troop of 25,000 people, 14. 94 to go and invade Italy, and he did. And the this was a troop uh, full of nobility. They took their time going down the peninsula. They smelled the flowers on the way down. They were exposed for the first time, well, most of them, to Italian culture. You know the Renaissance, Renaissance comes out of Italy. And they were welcomed into Naples. You know the Italian Italians politically, they never can really get things together to the present day. And so they welcomed them, but very soon they got fed up and pushed them out. And they scurried back up the peninsula and up. What Charles VIII did is he brought 24 artisans back with him to build in the Italian style in France. And this was the beginning of the Renaissance in France. So by 1495, we have these it Italian artisans that came in. And they included a sculptor, an architect, a gardener, a carpenter, perfume maker, a maker of incubators for chickens, a couple of tailors, tower builders, a dog breeder. Well, that may be not an Italian. His name was Mr. Neb, so he was obviously uh, not a, a black man. A uh, dog breeder that would have been for the hunt, you know. A parrot keeper, got to have one of those. And an organ builder by the name of Giovanni de Grana. So the Italians were building at this time no block bear organs. They were building organs with stops, Renaissance organs. The Italian style, I don't know if you know about the Italian style at the time, they had no mixtures, you know. They were uh, 
Every stop you pull out is a rank of pipes. Most of the principles, up to one foot or higher, half foot, a quarter foot, very high pitch, single rank, they would break back as you go up. That's a mixture break, but they would break back after the nonsense. This is the type of organ that certainly he would not have brought Giovanni de Grana to France to build welfare organs, because they had those. They knew about that. This was the new Renaissance. Now, the, this organ with stops is, in my mind, really the Renaissance organ. You know, in painting, in the Renaissance, you have three dimensions. You have, the, in the Renaissance, they develop perspective. Did you see on a two-dimensional canvas, you can see into the canvas as if it's three dimensions, like a photograph. They learn how to do that. With the organ, when you have an organ with stops, for the first time, people could hear into the organ and hear the combinations and hear what's inside that. It's a kind of three-dimensional effect. And, this, and the organ cases themselves were very three-dimensional. I'll be talking about the, 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 what was going on on the case themselves. <coughs> we know about Giovanni de Grana from this important text of, uh, that I took a cop photocopy of at the, at the Bibliothèque Nationale in France. This is a text that was, what happened was King, uh, King Charles VIII hit his head on a doorway. In his, at his chateau in Amboise. And the next king, Louis XII, wanted to have written a, a statement of the wages that were paid for all these Italians that had come in, because the, he was not around his payroll. He wanted to know what had been paid, what's owed, so So this is where this text is where we learn about these, who they were, what they did, and how much they were paid. And Giovanni de Grano was paid a normal, average sum of money per month to do work, uh, to build organs for the, for the king. Um, here is Amboise, where he hit his head. The kings of France did not live at Versailles or in Paris. They lived on the Loire Valley. And this is, was the center of activity. He certainly was, Giovanni de Grano was building Italian organs on the Loire Valley, which is very important. Because in the century, I've noticed that many of the organ builders came from the Loire Valley, and they began to build Italian-style organs very soon in France, having worked, no doubt, some of them at least, with Giovanni de Grana, learning from the king's builder. In 1500, the organ in Paris at the Saint-Chapelle, how many of you have been to the Saint-Chapelle? And the King of Paris is a very famous Saint Chapelle, the most incredible building. The organ in the, there was an organ in the Saint Chapelle, and it was sold in 1500. That I have a contract, I know it was sold. That organ was only seven years old, it had only been built seven years earlier. Who would ever heard of building an organ and then throwing, selling it seven years later? I don't have proof that Giovanni de Grana built a new organ for the Saint Chapelle. But I think I'm 99.9% .9 sure he did, because you would never throw out. A lot of work was going on at the Saint Chapelle, at the west side of the Saint Chapelle, at this time. And you don't throw out an organ. They kept the old, very big pedal towers called Tron, but they, the rest of the organ was sold. So, and we would not have a contract from the King's builder, because he's already on contract. So he's just told to build it. And they, so almost certainly, we have a new Italian style organ. And then in at the Saint Chapelle, there were organs all the way to the Revolution. You go into the building, you wonder how could they put an organ in there? It's all glass everywhere. But they did. They had this is the West End now. You know where do you put an organ? <laughs> but they had and all the way to the Revolution. There were there were organs, a series of organs in the Saint Chapelle. I'll return to the Saint Chapelle a little bit later. Now. The transition from the block barrack organ, big principal chorus organ, no stops, up to the organ stop happened quickly in France, but still there were a few last block barrack organs built. One, 1501, in Paris at a church called Saint Paul. It doesn't exist anymore, but I was just wanted to see where it was, and so a couple years ago I went 
to the Iran. I went to the street where I knew this old church is. And I didn't realize there's still a remnant of it. They left that wall. <laughs> it was a huge church. There was a giant block fair for it built in 1501. I think it was block fair. The contract doesn't mention stops. And all the contracts after that, if there are stops, they mention it because that costs money. And it was exciting for people that you could have an organ and make different sounds. So this doesn't mention it, but it was an expensive big organ. It had to be. Another one, one of the last, well, an organ in Shark Cathedral. Shark Cathedral, the, how many of you have been to Shark Cathedral? You know. The big organ is here. But Shark Cathedral had a root loft. You know, a root screen that separates the choir from the nave would often be a loft with an organ. Almost none of them exist in France anymore. After, after uh, the Council of Trent, they began to get rid of them in France. We still have them in Germany, in, some in Germany, and many in England, where you still have Rue Loft. There was an organ there on the Rue Loft. In 1504, there was a lot of work done on it, but there was no mention of stops. It was an old block fair, for sure. And the old organ here was certainly still an old block fair. They had two of them, one for the religious community, another for the but the same year, 1504, in the south of France, Montpellier, I have a contract that mentions that the organ would have eight stops. For them, and probably a large, I mean, this was a big, you know, a, a eight rather than zero is a lot. Um, and it, the contract says that they can be combined in 30 different ways. How exciting, you know, that you could combine these in 30 different ways. 1504, Montpellier, in the south of France. Poitiers, in 1506, two years later, a little organ was built by a, certain, a man, Louis Godet, who lived in the Loire Valley. Incidentally, the one from Mont the man from, who built in Montpellier also had been, was born in the Loire Valley. Uh, that organ in Poitiers, 1506, had seven stops, and the contract just says they can be combined in diverse ways. Now, that same builder went down from Poitiers to Bordeaux. And in 1510, he built a larger organ in a very large church, Saint Michel. It's not the cathedral, but you sure would think it is if you go there. I was just there about a year ago. Very tall, very large church. An organ uh, at Saint Michel. And what's interesting, especially for this, is he left us the very first stop, a combination list. Not a stop list, but a list of combinations that could be played on that organ. The, the organ builder. This would be happened sometimes in the 16th century, but only in 1510. And this combination list has drawn a lot of attention to scholars in recent years because it's a kind of riddle. It, he gives stop numbers, but we have no contract with the names. We don't know what the numbers correspond to. We don't even have a stop list. Fenner Douglas, who was my mentor, a name that probably many of you know, you should know. Uh, Fenner Douglas was the first to realize, well, this was certainly an Italian style. And he made a guess at what he thought the different numbers meant, different styles. We don't accept it anymore. But the important thing is that he figured out that's, that's the riddle we have to figure out. And then a number of scholars since then, and I have my own ideas of what the different styles are. Combinations, he has names, and they tend to be the names of the consort instruments, or consort groups. You know, in the Renaissance, you have little groups of instruments that play together, like a little consort of recorders, or you have a little group of shawms, a little group of sackbuts and cornets, consorts of the little groups. The combinations of the organs were named very often after these different consorts. It was, they were combining principles of different pitches and imagining that they were hearing shams or flutes or whatever, some, some other sounds. A little bit the way I had an organ. I was a kid, I had a little had a organ, and I pulled up, and I imagine that's a clarinet, and that's a trumpet. Well, you know, it doesn't really, but if you use your imagination to believe it, it's, you know it isn't, but you think it is, you know? You want to believe it. You want to believe that's really an old one. So you could have found something like an old one. It was something like that, you know? They were having a good time. Well, anyway, what's interesting, though, is 
that it, they were a lot of scars with them, but nobody realized until I went and looked that there are two combination lists, two different versions. So that has helped me. They're a little different from each other. Both probably, well, they're just slightly different, but enough different that when you're dealing with numbers, it's a kind of chain reaction. If you get one of them wrong, they're all. So this is how good. I'm not going to tr tell you what all the combinations I think they are. They're little, mostly little <coughs> combinations of no more than three stops drawn at once. In the Renaissance, that was true. You had the principal course, but then for most of your combinations, one, two, three stops, because fewer stops gives you more color. That's true today as much as it was then. You begin to add too many stops, you lose color. So they were usually little combinations, often gapped, 82, 81, 81, 83. But I think they were just having a lot of fun drawing different combinations. Now this organ at, at Saint Michel in Bordeaux uh, was on the um, way of St. James. Has anybody ever gone to southern, to northern Spain? Yes. Yeah, yeah. you have. Um, many of the organs that were along the, through France, there were these various routes that would take you the pilgrimage routes. And this was one church that was on the route. And I've noticed that the organs that were on the route, like the way of St. James, these pilgrimage churches would have a lot of accessories. They would have statues, moving statuary, all kinds of fun. It would attract people. Brings money into the city. Oh, very good. Here's a statue of St. Michael that is in the church, out on the organ. But that is just because it's on the way of St. James, a very famous old statue. But the organ itself would also have statues. The organ at Saint Michel, we know from the contract, had uh, angel sounding trumpets that moved. The organist could hold a stop and the angel would move. The trumpet that sounded would be on the chest, but you would hear it sound. The angel would move, bring the trumpet to the mouth. You'd think that this coming from an angel. It also had a statue, not this one, but not that one, but a statue of St. Michael that would move, fighting the devil. If somehow he was looking like he was fighting the turning stars, and it had clacking heads. They would make these scary heads with jaws that would open and shut that the organist would pull and clap, kind of funny things. The organs of this time had many of these accessories. Uh, and it, as I mentioned, it had uh, the stops and the combinations were named very often after, or, or after the consorts. They, they had uh, combinations such and stops such as cornet, shawm, different kinds of flutes, German flutes, recorders, fifes, canary flutes, lario, uh, these are all kinds of flutes, soft flutes, big flutes, trembling flutes, the kind of celestial flute. That's not like a bois celeste, like this new trembling or something. Um, we're not sure. Sackbutts, those are trombones, could imitate that. Trumpets, battle trumpets, violin, uh, different bells, cymbals, carillon, different kinds of reeds, regal, dulcium, bagpipes, small and large. All really, you know, from a very few stops. They came up with imagination. All this stuff, you know? And also, the stops and combinations often had the names of voices, children's voices, men, women. Um, there was a stop called the brode, or the combination of the brode. The brode is defined as a loose woman. Uh, this is a concrete in 1610, said it was a swart, sunburnt wench. But it also had the word we get broad. It had some kind, you can imagine some husky, husky, maybe gap or tune to the or some tremor, uh, maybe smoking too much. Falsettos, um, nasal sounds uh, are, are quite common. Bird imitations, nightingale and chickens, little chickens, parakeets, ducks, canard in French is duck. The nasa, you know that we get tune to the birds? That was originally called canard, duck. And then it got changed to nasa, to nasal. But it makes sense either way, you know? Um, and, uh, and so on. Oh, I have found over 150 names of stops and combinations. Probably, again, a very few number of stops, but with many different fancy names. And that doesn't count the accessories. Accessories included bells, drums. Uh, drums were often made with two pipes, a little out of tune with each other. 
And we know about that. Well, here's what it looks like today. This is a different case. This is the Mushabel's very, very famous case built in the 18th century. This is one of the most beautiful cases in Europe. Maybe the most beautiful, the spectacular case. The man who built this, Mushabel, made a very big description of the old organ that had been there. So I learned about, not from a legal document, but from his description of the old organ, uh, which had been built at the same time that the ball paintings were put in by Italians. He built, there had been an old organ built uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Italian style, and he describes it in great detail. It was originally located there. His, his, he gives, tells you the dimensions. This balcony had been higher, and he had it lowered. And there isn't, many books have been written about Audi Cathedral, so famous, and about the artwork in Audi. And this fantastic um, medieval uh, depiction of the Last Judgment that's below it, there isn't one art historian that knows that the balcony was reduced and a whole layer of heaven was taken off <laughs> at that time. <laughs> they don't know because they don't read organ, anything to do about the cat world. So I'm writing an article about that because it would be very interesting for them to realize the middle had been mutilated in the, uh, uh, ninth, in the 18th century and taken out, but they didn't know that this, so it makes a lot, and then the organ cases had a depiction of, from the last judgment up to heaven, and then the heaven to go, it was fantastic. It was the largest, 24 foot Italian style organ with a spring chest. I'm not gonna get into actions, but it was a type of chest, not like a, um, not like a slider, like the organ I played yesterday, but this was a different kind of action. Uh, that's how this is. One case that still exists, that from 1523, a polychrome case in the south of France, very close to Audi, not very, you could get there in an hour. This case had been painted brown, and during a recent restoration, they discovered it had been polychrome. So they took off the brown covering from the 19th century, and voila, there's this fantastic case. Inside this organ is a beautiful Cavalier Colt, but the case is 1523. This was an Italian style organ. Now, I mentioned the Italian style in France. Also, mixtures came in very early. One of the first was in Angers, also here. Also, on the, this is the Loire. Also on the Loire. And this, the contracts, the, the contractual uh, documents surrounding Angers were transcribed in the 19th century, but not very well. And so I went back to them. And according to the old transcription, there were 48 stops on this organ. Uh, it's impossible. There wasn't any organ in France and in, the, in the entire century that had anything like 48 stops. Well, the problem was, as I found often, one little tiny misread of a Roman numeral. It's eight stops, not 48. So just a little sneery thing on the page, and Eight, of course, it's a broken one that had eight stops, but we know it had a mixture. So there were already early mixtures on some organs of France, two types coexisting the Italian type with no mixtures and the mixture organ. That Angers organ was, and the dating has also been confused, and I just built 1510, 1512. Now, we move ahead a little bit. To back to the Saint Chapelle, a new organ was put in. Uh, there is a drawing. Oh, of the, well, we won't go ahead quite yet. This is a drawing of the organ in Angers I just talked about. A drawing, sometimes we have, this organ doesn't exist, but they have a drawing from 1510 that shows what it looked like when it had been put in back in 1510. Um, oh, and before I go, before I go to this back to Saint Chapelle, I just mentioned the cases I mentioned often had. The case was almost like a, a, something that you could inhabit. It was almost like, uh, like um, a dwelling place for saints, for musicians. And on the fronts of the cases, you get fantastic images. Musicians playing their music. You know, the Renaissance loved the secular. You've got musicians. This is Saint Bertrand de Comanche. Here you have, in, further in the north, you have Ron Lee, some musicians playing different instruments. The most complete case, uh, and actually
actually complete organ from the time is from the very far south, San Saldan, way down in the south. And I'll show you that case. It, that still exists very much the way it originally was. There it is. And you have the clacking heads down here. You can barely see them. But I have a close-up. They still exist. There they are, the jaws that can be organs can you when they clack up and down. 1557, this organ was built. Uh, the action from 1557, when it was restored, still worked. That was a slider action, still worked. Uh, this is a, a Norgard before could have had the picture in one of his publications of the different clapping heads that still exist in France, and there they all are. This one is a lot of fun. You know, the eyes, when you pull, the mouth goes up and down, this eye goes up and down, and this one goes this way. <laughs> so completely wide, you know, completely wide. Uh, this, back to Saint Savin, 1557 organ. There's the side of the case. Now you can't see. You know, they, in the Renaissance, they love nudity. They love, I mean, of course, the Huguenots did not. In the wars of religion in France that broke out in 1562 put a stop to that. But they got away with a lot. You know, they would often put uh, Old Testament. Characters. Well, they have the clapping heads at the bottom. Then you have a little bit of the angels and saints way up above. But in here you have Old Testament figures, including Adam. Take a good look at Adam. He's looking over at Eve. He's very embarrassed. Yeah, to see. Uh, it's a, a trinity of ejaculate came up. You know, there it is. It survived because this place was almost abandoned for centuries. It survived. But you have to wonder how much was going on back then that the Huguenots you know, destroyed more organs than anybody else. The Protestants in France in 1562 was the worst year. But if they had gotten their hands on that, it would have gone, I assure you. Now, the organ case, I'll just stick with the organ case one. They began to look like, in places you would inhabit, they began to look like a chateau. This is a very beautiful case that still exists on the left, built in 1542. Uh, and you'll notice you have these towers and flats between it. And here's one of the most famous chateaux. It's the same. They look like a place that you could live in. In fact, it's kind of that way. It's like a heavenly abode, uh, the organ case in France with the musicians, the sound, and the angels, and the trumpets, and the, all that coming out from inside, living inside it. One of the most famous cases from the Renaissance, we have to show Sharp Cathedral. It's an older case, but it was completed in 1542. It was completed, the, this, the metal towers had been separate, and they were combined, connected, very artistically. It's dark, if you go to Sharp Cathedral, it's very dark. When they do another restoration, Bertrand Cattio, the organ builder, told me they're going somehow, they're going to lighten it up, get it back to the way it was. Maybe it was polychrome, I don't know, but it's too dark. But it was a fantastic case. In 1542, they changed it from a block barrack into an organ with stops. And we have a stop list. It was a few, a few stops. Uh, they had a little positive with the trumpet on it uh, that was uh, added and, and uh, made it an organ. Now, what the, oh, one more. Alençon, there's a case, there's where Alençon is. This is the case that they're going to restore this organ. You can see what bad shape. Maybe you can see this all bent, falling. You know how big pipes can collapse after a while. Uh, Alençon, the stock list of Alençon we have from a contract, there it is. This is the largest organ of the time in France in terms of number of stops, 1537. Uh, it has a principal. 16, you know, they would count it 12 and 6, that means it starts on F, but it sounds 16, but it doesn't go all the way down. So 16 foot, 8 foot, 4 foot principal, an 8 foot mixture, and a 2 foot mixture above it. Then a bunch of flutes, 8, 4, 2 of them at 4 foot, 2 and a third, 2, 1 and a third. That's the whole stop list for the grave. And then the positive had something called Wyoming, I think a multi 4 foot, principal 4 foot, and a trumpet. And something called heart, but we're not sure what that is, because you flew. That was the biggest. But you could imagine their fun making all kinds of sounds. An organ 
in San Julian Rousseau, I reported on a couple years ago in that CD of 1531 uh, music from Atenon. This is an interest, very interesting organ. It has been reconstructed. The case is original, and it's one of the few organs in France in which the pipework in the case, the facade pipes are original. They've never been melted down at the revolution or sometimes when with the, you know, the wars of religion to make them into bullets or something. They, they are still existent there. It's a very interesting, it's lead, tin, lead, tin, lead, every other one. And downstairs, you can't hear the difference. You would never, I believe that, oh, I would certainly hear the difference. No one couldn't hear the difference. Anyway, I recorded on that Renaissance music from 1531, and if you play the Atenon, wonderful music. Uh, so I hope you get, and I made my recording with a percussion player playing some of the, because of the nature of the organ at the time. It had, about a third of them had percussion. There's half of that organ with the patron saint of the church. There's a little closer. It has some shawm types here, wooden shawm types. Okay, back to the Saint Chapelle. Now, in about 1556, a new organ was put in. Uh, that would has almost certainly come from Belgium down. It's a new style, very important for the change of style in France. This is a drawing that was done in 1580 of that. That organ doesn't exist anymore. Uh, do, we don't know exactly when it was built, but it had to have been built during the reign of Henry II. And there is on the organ, here, you can't see it. Here and here, there are two these look like these. There, that's the best I could do. You can sort of see. That was the symbol for Henry and Catherine the Medici, two C's. That was his wife. Uh, here you can see. That was Catherine the Medici symbol. This was his. You put them together, you get that. However, everybody knew that that really looks like these. <clears throat> Diane de Poitiers was his mistress. And everybody knew this is really a symbol of Henry and Diane de Poitiers. Mistress, there she is in all her glory. She loved the pain of you. Now, we don't know much about that organ at the Saint-Chapelle. We know it had to have been built before 1560, around maybe 1556, when Henry II was still alive, before he lost his life in a tournament. Uh, we know about it from a contract that was done a couple of decades later during the reign of Henry III. During this very bad period, he reigned from 1574 to 1589. This was during the wars of religion. And Catherine de Medici had enormous control. Uh, Henry III, uh, they went around trying to, to make buildings and in this case, the organ, seem more masculine, more fortress-like. They would change the size of the building because of this threat. And the organ itself, during this time, at the Saint-Chapelle, the contract says that every stop, the base had to be strengthened. It was like you were trying to make this very strong. It's kind of ironic because he was the gay, the gay um, king. He wasn't going to have any children. Nobody thought he was going to have any he never did. He had his little mignon that he ran around with. And he was a, he eventually was murdered. And that came, the Valois line came to an end. And then well, Henry IV came in after that. Henry IV had been Protestant. He changed to Catholic. He went back to Protestant. Then he said famously, oh, Paris is worth a mass. I'll become Catholic again. Henry IV became Catholic. And became the next king after Henry, after, uh, Henry III. Uh, what's interesting is that people have believed that the, the new style of building, uh, the Titulus style, came in at this time, 1580, at a church in Gisel. And you will read this in your book, that, that this new style uh, came in right at this time, 1580. But that is a complete misunderstanding because the contracts that that's based on for Gisor are not from 1580. I've gone and looked at them in the, in the archives. Those are later contracts. 
The real beginning of the French classical style came at Rouen Cathedral with Jean Titelou's 20 years later, 1600, uh, when he had a builder come down from Flan from who had been working in Flanders, a man by the name of Carlier, Chacun Carlier. He came down and they established a very new style of building, often using the same kind of cases that existed, but quite radically modified uh, in what we would see then, as I mentioned, as a kind of proto-classical, pre-classical style, very close to the classical. There's a stock list from, not from Rouen Cathedral, where he brought Carlier down, because we don't have that stock list. But here's one that, that Carlier did in 1611. Teacher Luz was the consultant for this organ, and this really looks very French classical already. Just two manuals rather than the, we did have the half keyboard to go for the race scene and, and the echo. But you have a classical chorus with two mixtures, Cornish and Samba. Also on the quantity, classical chorus with two mixtures, principal and Samba. That's typical of the classical, French classical. You have a bunch of flutes. That's not so different from what had happened earlier. Then you have trumpet and carol, two, the two trumpet class reads on the ground. You have Cromorne on the post, it's very important for a French class, so you'll have to have that. And you have this five rank cornet, you know, five, eight, four, two thirds, two, one and three thirds, starting in the middle of the keyboard. That came in with Carl, with uh, Carlier and Titelou, very important for the French class. So that goes into the reed chorus, so it strengthens the top of the reed chorus. Um, and you have, for, for Titelou, what's so important that it has not existed earlier, you have a wide range pedal, C up to E flat in this organ, could be up to E, even up to F, uh, which is an eight foot flute open, and uh, it's called sac butt or trumpet, in fact, could be e either name was used for that stop. This is very wide range, so you can play in the pedal the chant, which was so important uh, that from the Council of Trent, the different councils, they wanted to hear the chant. This is a really, truly, a, a counter-reformation instrument. This is a much beefed up. It has the big, two big choruses. It has more mixtures than the early organs did. Uh, it has the ability to sound the chant in the pedal. This is something of really a, a, a counter-reformation sort of concept. There is an historic organ that I recorded on, I think I can paint, Titulus on this organ in Bolbeck. Normandy. It had been in Rouen. It got moved. After the revolution, it was moved. Titulus was probably the consultant for this organ. So that's why I recorded here. It's the best, I think, certainly the best Titulus organ in France. Really a polyphonic sound. Right? You hear clear polyphony. You want to hear that with that polyphonic music. Uh, and it's a terrific organ. Uh, that's the last stop, uh, the slide I have. Do we have, should I put out a recording or two, or should I just tell people get the recording? Uh, or do they have to leave right now? Uh, we can go another nine or ten minutes. So should I do questions, or should I put another couple of recordings? What would be better? Up to you all. I think questions From would be great. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe questions. And then one recording? I do have a couple more recordings. If you're interested, you can share them. I'll give them to you. I will not charge you for them. Uh, I love the music of Titus. I would say with Titus, one of the, the, the main problem with Titus is something studied in repertoire class and then nobody wants to play it. It looks kind of very silly, you know, and very, it's, it's Flemish counterpoint, you know. Very, it's a little, it's very serious. But Tito, but my work on this has really made me think a lot about registration practice. Tito says, in the introduction of the he says, you can play the bass of the pedal, the left hand on one keyboard and the right hand on another keyboard. And I think the middle verses of all the hands that's the way it would have been done. There are also other texts. There are some rules from Trois Cathedral 1630 that tell us a little about how different combinations were used at different points. And so I think all of the first movements are plangier, the principal chorus movements, you know, with pedal trumpet pattern. I think the last verses mostly are reed chorus pieces. So I did last night on the reed chorus. Then the middle of the trios, you can put up two, three keyboards, a pedal name on keyboard. So I've really worked very hard in registration, trying to bring this music to life. People look at this serious music and they think, oh, serious combination, I'll put it on an eight foot principle. Oh, I'll make it exciting, put it on a four foot principle. 
I think that's the furthest thing from the truth. The more serious the music, the more it needs some color. And he was obviously in particular was interested in color. So listen, look at my recordings, and you can get the combinations I use online. But I do talk about the combinations in the notes that they did. Uh, so it's, it's the first complete recording of Titulus, I think, mainly for that reason. People don't really quite know what to do with it. So I'm trying to help. Uh, it's not like the French classical yet, where the combinations are set. But I think some things are set. I think the first movements of Prince of the Court, again, the last movements, may, many of them probably be. There are certain combinations are set that maybe not always as much as the French classical, where you know this piece is for the Bastion. That This one's this, you know, wasting the coffee over there. Okay, your, your questions. Yes? Did you record your videos in, like, you did last night, like, the choir and all No, I would have liked to do that, but I didn't have a budget for bringing the choir over. And I think, frankly, I don't, I'm not at the stage with the choral knowing yet quite what to do. I will be talking about that on Thursday at Eastman, the alternating group. I'm working on it, uh, but I'm not comfortable. And it would have made it much longer and more expensive to have four CDs instead of three. So, um, so the answer is no, but it would have been nice. I wish I could. So you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did these organs have been tuned? These were uh, mean tone. Uh, through Kitulus, the old Lockhart were no doubt Pythagorean, were the pure fits. At some point, around the time Stocks came in, they were changing over to mean tone of pure major thirds. So the Volbeck, Volbeck organ is actually fifth kind of mean tone. If you know, I don't want to get into that too much, but it's a kind of mean tone close to the classic chord of mean tone. Actually, fifth kind of sounds very, very strong. Uh, the Titulus has only three sharps and two flats. It never goes past E flat. It never goes past G sharp, which is kind of an indication. There's one place I've mentioned to you where it has one D sharp, and the text is our ears have seen. Well, it tells me because D sharp would be very out of tune in mean tone, and that's why he wanted that to be out of tune because the ears have seen. But otherwise, the, the use of accidentals tells us mean tone. Uh, around the mid century. 1650s, they were changing over to uh, later systems. And I wrote my, my Stanford dissertation from many years ago, 86, is a, it talks about change of the pitch classes in the music. We did to get D sharps, A sharps, E sharps, A flat, D flat, finally a D flat would be green. And the tunings that were gradually changing in France during that later part of the 70s. But the Titulus period was certainly mean tone. Mean tone. Absolutely. There's a one text from 1650 from Denis. He says, You just by you can play these bad notes, these sharps, and make these transpositions to F minor. Well, he didn't use that word, but F with an A flat above it. He said, You can trill on those notes, it doesn't help, it's still out of tune. <laughs> so it means that they were beginning to, you know, experiment doing transpositions outside of the Other questions? find that playing digital music on an American organ in a dead room in an equal temperament is still satisfying to you and to the people who hear it? It would be if I hadn't heard it the other way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all in this uh, boat, you know, and what is ideal? Now, uh, I think yesterday I it was not a mean tone organ, mm -hmm. but I was quite happy, quite yeah. content playing it there. It had a cornet, it had some sounds that were, and the, the organ of Tidalou's time is not quite like the French classical either. The, the reeds are not quite as big. The, uh, the organ, the clarity of the principal chorus is much more in Tidalou's. He had, he put in a one and three fifths, I don't know if you happen to notice it, a principal scale one that could be used with the principal chorus that helps clarify to it. And the organ has that, the Fritz organ, so I use it. That helps her. So uh, that I was very content with. Maybe there's a, we're all different. Mm -hmm. We very rarely, uh, as students, I mean, how often do you play the organ that is perfect for the music you're playing? You don't have that. Uh, it, it, some places have many more variety, you know, in Houston we have quite a good variety, but we don't have the mean one organ in Houston. So, you know, uh, you, uh, my suggestion is yes, play, enjoy. And uh, you will, there will be some point in which you can't go. Last time I played it 10 years ago, I played Vienna. Well, it was okay, but it wasn't the Vienna. So uh, I accepted it. 
So I didn't answer your question. I think we're all good. We have to just decide what works for us. Um, yeah. I recently, well, a few years ago, purchased a CD from the AGO that was talking about different tunings of organs and sort of tunings. Is mind. that you? Was it a CD? They put it on CD? They was put it, it on CD, CD, yeah. Oh, they changed Originally it. Originally, that was me. That's Stanford. Stanford awesome. University has a wonderful, check this wonderful out. It's fiscal, really cool yeah, wonderful fiscal organ that uh, has a lever. You move the lever, it, the organ is in mean tone, and you move the lever, five accidentals, they go down back up again. It's a big organ, it's like, I don't know, up, and it turns into a well tempered system that Carl Fogel worked out. And the top manual of that organ has mean tone temperament with a pure major thirds and split keys. So you have an E flat and a D sharp above it, a G sharp and an A flat above it. So you can use the, uh, well, the Oberlin has an organ like that. Well, so you have these extra notes for the mean tone. So it's a very interesting organ. That organ also, incidentally, that church has an, another organ in mean tone in the uh, side chapel that Paul Fritz built, a famous scholar. Because the fisk organ is the mean tone is fifth time, if I didn't mention. And the Fritz is quarter time. You can see, you can hear four different temperaments in one church. It's the best place that I know in the States to go to hear temperaments. Because you hear equal temperament, on a beautiful old Murray Harris organ from 1901, and then you can hear your fifth common mean tone and a well-tempered system, like a sort of box sort of system, and then you have quarter common mean tone on a little wooden Fritz uh, organ from Cheney's stuff. Yeah. But that, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so the many years for us. Many Thank years. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate so you might want to listen to that. Yeah. Are there any instances of Huguenot builders doing anything to organs other than the strong <laughs> Now even I know. Sure. I know. That wasn't there. They saw it as a, as a papist sort of a pope's thing, you know? And you can kind of imagine from what I said today, there was a lot of other these distractions, hacking heads and everything. You know, there were family. And they just went through France in 1562 and destroyed enormously. Then for many years, there was no organ built, very little organ built, just some repair, some small instrument. The organ pre in the century of Soul was built during that period, but it was a very small organ. That's one of the reasons I believe that T. Lewis was successful at bringing the Flemish style down and adapting it in his own way, because he could bring a builder down, and in fact, I know of five Flemish builders that came down to France during the late, or just before T. Lewis. Uh, there was an opportunity for them, and they wanted to build in what they thought was a more advanced style which became then the French classical style. And interestingly, they also went to Spain. And that's why many of the Spanish stops are like the French, the corneta and the big reeds in Spain came out of that same, the Flemish builders going there. So if they were very, the Flemish builders were the most important. You know, Flemish, just north of the French, or what we, most of it is what we would call Belgium. That's, it. Our, that's modern boundary, just by the way. But, and they went up into northern uh, uh, Netherlands and built, and they went to Germany. They were the most important around 1600 to uh, disseminate, and each country they went to adapted and it became their classic, their national style. A very interesting the British history of the organ, how that happened. But in France, it's what, be, with teachers, it became, especially the wide pedal. That didn't come from Flanders. That was somehow teachers got that, maybe from being in. Maybe he met sailing and went up north. I don't know where they had a wide head. But that's so important for the French class where they had that wide eight foot base. Do you know? 16 foot and eight in the head. That's French class. One more. Well, I think maybe one more. Mm -hmm. What do we know about Titus and uh, his contemporaries' technique when it came to playing? That's a very big question. We don't know very much. But I'll try to maybe think of how I can answer that a little bit. We know uh, from, and we have even looked at Mersenne, uh, 1636, a very important treatise on organ building. And Mersenne talks about uh, the, the, the ornamentation. We know the ornamentation, but it would not have been French classical. It would not have been like Bach ornamentation. It would be more Italian type ornamentation. You know, I think we, we mix it. We learn uh, trills, upper note trills. You know, we learn these little rules that fit for one slice of the repertoire, and then we forget, oh, if I'm playing a or if I'm playing a bird, or 
and a festival, it's not taboo. If I'm playing Mozart, we have to forget that. You know, it's, it's, we, we often feel, and books do it, it's very hard, it's a very sort of grimly edge. edge. Um, but we know there was ornamentation, there was an ad, and some you wrote one. Um, we know he must have had quite a pedal technique because the pedal lines, if you were to play the bass lines, which I believe you should, on these little pedals, you know they're only about, there's a kind of embarrassing that people go to, there's a little YouTube thing of me playing and both that on these little tiny pedals. It's fun. But in fact, Tito's, you can do that, it's no more complicated than dreaming. So he must have had a pretty good pedal technique, as did dreaming for those little tiny pedals, you know, because dreaming, when you play the dreaming, those three got sang, they're rather, you know, they're not Bach to cons, but you couldn't possibly do that on those little pedals. But for given the size of the nature of those pedal boards, they're quite complicated. They're full polyphonic bass lines, you know, for the purple uh, So he must have had a very good technique. He wrote interesting poetry. He was also a poet. We know a little about Tito. I don't think he'd been in jail by the poetry. We, we know he was a poet. He wrote poems about the organ. And the most famous, and he won two prizes in Rouen for his poetry. I don't know if anybody thinks nowadays it's good poetry, but it is interesting. The, he wrote poetry about the organ, and what, one thing that he wrote is that the organ sings, and he's not the only one, but at the time, at the time this is good for Westminster Park, right? the organ sings, and it answers the choir, and it produces a great harmony out of mute metal. This is a little refrain that comes back. A great harmony out of mute metal singing this, that, that these wonderful sounds were invented in God's temple in order to praise him. And I think it's a really a very counter-reformation. So it's the thinking that we have to thrill people once again. I love early music. Early music should be exciting for people. It can also be serious and contemplative. You know, we can meditate during some of it. But like Mike Victoria, some of this kind of it should be exciting for people. If it's not, and I don't know what we're in the business for. Is it just for academic? I'm an academic, but you know, it cannot be just that. We want to bring it to life. So that's my life goal, is to, to try to bring the music to life. Try to bring music like the Antonio recording, the Correa Arabo, and the, the Titul, is to bring this music back to life so we can enjoy it. And with your fantastic professor doing so much work commissioning new pieces, I also write, have, in the past, I have recordings of my own. I believe very much in that, too. We, as you go through, but your goal now is to become a great musician. It has to be. That has to be the step. But I also hope that all of you will have projects and do, do interesting things. And keep the organ interesting for people as much as you can. Otherwise, it will die like anything. I don't think it will. But I think you, you guys, you're the future. You will make, it, uh, make people want to hear whatever it is you're playing. If you love it and believe in it, you can convey that. And that's been, you know, people thought, Tito's who would ever? I believe it's possible. I can do it. So then I, you know. Um, I think maybe with that, maybe we yeah. should quit. Thank, thank you for being such a great audience. And